And welcome to The Atheist Experience. I'm your host, Jen Peoples, and today is December 31st, 2017. With me today for our last show of 2017 is Dr. Claire Woolner. Thank you. How are you? Glad to be here. I am super glad to be here. All right. I'm looking forward to this, but before we get started, let me give a quick shout out to our crew and our live studio audience. Yay. Um, yeah, thanks. Go, go. Uh, the crew generously agreed to come in here and produced, produce this New Year's Eve special episode on evolution. Um, so thanks to them. And because it is New Year's Eve and people already have plans tonight, there will be no meetup tonight at Star of India. So just a heads up, if you're headed out to Star of India, we won't be there tonight. <laughs> So before we get started, also I uh, need to let you know the Atheist Experience is produced by the Atheist Community of Austin, which is a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization dedicated to separation of church and state and the promoting the positive atheist culture. Uh, we broadcast live from our studio in the ACA library um, in Austin, Texas, every Sunday at 4.30 p.m. Central Time. You can watch us live and recorded episodes on YouTube and comment on the show at the open thread provided for each episode at freethoughtblogs.com slash AXP. Uh, you can also add comments on YouTube while the live show is running, and you can write to the show at tv at atheist-community.org or join the official discussion group on Facebook. So... Um, I think we have one special announcement mm -hmm. that Claire and I are both very excited about, and that is, um, back by public demand, Godless Bitches 2.0 will reboot beginning in February. So, right. yes, thank you. <laughs> so it will be me, Tracy, and Claire um, doing Godless Bitches 2.0. So stay tuned for more announcements on that. Yeah. All right, so um, you have a special episode yep. on evolution you want to talk about, yep. and there's a reason that you're passionate about this subject, so I want you to tell us a little bit about okay. your background and Alrighty. what you do. Okay, I, uh, I mean, I'm Dr. Claire Wilner. I have a PhD actually in biology, specializing in entomology and behavior. Um, behavior uh, and entomology were just what I specialized in. I try to learn everything I can about biology. Um, when I moved to Texas, it became really clear to me that learning and understanding science was super key. Uh, I was raised in Iowa where the education system very much emphasized great science. I had an amazing science uh, background when I was in Iowa. The high school was top notch. Um, so coming here, I became it became very clear that uh, People's opinion on science uh, shouldn't be an opinion, and, and I needed to do something about that. So I became very active in uh, fighting against the State Board of Education uh, to get science taught in the schools here. Um, other things that I've done that are in support of reason and um, the secular world is um, I'm on the board of the ACA here and also on Foundation Beyond Belief which is another great secular organization. Um, so, um, I think where this all started was I was attending that State Board of Education uh, hearing in 2009, and uh, there was a press conference going on uh, where Kathy Miller was speaking. She's with the Texas Freedom Network. And a woman walked through while the speaker was talking and said, my granddaddy was not an ape. And uh, of course, everybody stopped for a moment. And here's the thing, there isn't anybody in that room who disagrees with that. If you're a scientist, you're not gonna agree with that either. Um, but what it said to me is that there is, among folks who don't understand what evolution means, that there's a visceral reaction to not wanting to be evolved from the great apes. And I think uh, that's why I started doing this, to try to deal with people uh, having difficulties with evolution. So Mark, if you could start the slideshow, please. That'd be great. Okay. Um, so, whoop, there I went too fast. All right, so 
let's start with the basics. Um, just, we're going to talk about headaches. Everybody gets them. We know they're real. No uh, mystery there. Um, so what th the difference is, is that uh, if we want to understand what causes headaches, we have to ask questions, do research, and um, maybe come up with a drug, um, uh, maybe something called hammered, hammer that ha headache, get hammered, whatever. Uh, so if you have enough data all pointing to the same thing causing headaches, then eventually you might have what you could call a theory of headaches. So just to summarize that really quickly, headaches are real, nobody questions that. What causes them? There's a lot of science behind it, a lot of study that needs to go on, and so if we had everything pointing to the same thing causing headaches, we could have a theory of headaches. We've seen this before, you have, I don't care where you are in the religious spectrum. If you have uh, uh, bacteria, you know that that caused illness. We did not always know that. At one point, we thought it may be ether or whatever. We now know that cells, germs, cost, cause um, illness. So we know it's real. What causes it? There's a whole theory about how germs cause it, and that's called germ theory or cell theory. Uh, gravity, we all know that's real. No argument there. It is a fact. There is a huge body of science studying the attraction of things to one another. It is not terribly well understood. It's still a fact, but we have theory of gravity, which is where science studies that. And you know that evolution, and scientists say this all the time, is a fact. If you don't think you know it, let me tell you why I think you know it. If you get a flu shot, you know it. The flu shot that worked last year is not gonna work this year because the organism that causes flu evolves from year to year. You get a new one. That's evolution. It's just a change in the organism over time. In Australia, the cane toad was introduced and over a very short period of time, that organism, that a species of frog, a toad, excuse me, has evolved to have legs that are better at hopping, going greater distance. Uh, that, that's evolution. It's a fact. All right? So evolution is a fact. The same way gravity is a fact, germs are a fact, no different. We know it's real. That's what scientists mean when they say evolution is a fact. When we say it's a theory, that doesn't mean we're guessing. It means that that's how we're studying to find out what causes that evolution. So, I hope that's pretty clear. I wish I could somehow have feedback from people listening. Maybe you'll uh, write in or uh, somehow let us know. Well, if, if I understand it, basically I've often described evolution as the overall model that explains all the facts. Mm -hmm. And it's contradicted by none of the facts. Yep. And it's tested all the time. Mm -hmm. But that model, that theory part, is what allows us to make predictions like which, uh, what should the flu vaccine contain this year so that it will prevent the maximum number of flu cases? Absolutely. Absolutely, there's the science. Uh, evolution has a tremendous ability to predict uh, a result, and that's something that's uh, not very well understood. When I have, I have a lot of um, difficulties with evolution that I'm gonna be talking about, hopefully over uh, several shows, uh, um, if they'll invite me back. And uh, there are, I have eight right now. My husband, who is from the latch on the buckle of the Bible Belt, uh, he sat with me and I said, so what exactly is it that makes people react like they do to evolution where it seems so obvious to me? And he just outlined these ideas, boom, 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 oh, brilliant. So I'm gonna, there are eight of them and I'm gonna talk about just one of them today. And uh, I'm gonna first tell you what they all are. So um, back to the slides if you would, Mark, thank you. 
Um, so the very first one, it's emotionally icky. That thing that the woman said at the State Board of Education hearing, um, my granddaddy was not an ape. Okay, we'll deal with that one today. The, what we would call incredulity, like I can't believe it. What about the missing links? There's just so much I don't get about it. Um, the Probably one of the ones that comes up for me when I talk to people a lot is understanding the scale of time there. It is a long, long time to be talking about millions and billions of years, and I will be dealing with that. Um, the lack of evidence, they feel like there's no evidence. I am going to spend, if I, if I get to do this again, I really hope I do, uh, time talking about nothing but the evidence that we have supporting evolution. Uh, science likes to talk about how evolution makes just much, so much more sense. It's, it's parsimonious, it's simple. Well, if you're religious and you simply say that God did it all, that seems far more simple. I get that, and we're gonna talk about that too. Number six is that evolution is ungodly. There's a notion that evolution and religion can never uh, be in the same room together, and we'll talk about that. And also, what's the big deal? Uh, you can do plenty of science without being uh, uh, somebody who accepts evolution. Sure you can. Why are scientists, in, especially in, in biology, so obsessed with it? We'll talk about that. And then the black box. This is the toughest one, I think, for most people. If you want to understand how an engine works, you peek under the hood, or a computer, you tear it apart, you figure it out. Uh, evolution, we can't exactly get inside a cell and the average person, they, they just can't look in there and see what's going on. So this, I'm going to explain the mechanism by which it happens. That might sound scary and, and horrible, but trust me, I can bring it to anybody. Alrighty, so let's deal with icky. My granny was not an ape, that's fine. I get it. When you're approaching the great ape house, what do you think about? The smell, um, it's cramped, the animals, you know, they're hairy, they walk around on their knuckles, they're usually unkempt, uh, they don't seem terribly bright, they seem kind of lazy and dull, and these are all things that we don't find to be something that we would want to be closely related to. I get it. I really do. Um, it's like if you're this lovely little ground squirrel and somebody says to you, you are a rodent and so is this naked mole rat. And by the way, that naked mole rat is an actual species. It exists and it is a rodent. It is in the exact, it is in the same family as that squirrel. Yikes. I don't think the squirrel wants to be related to that any more than a lot of people want to be related to a gorilla. I get it. But let's get down to basics. When you study anything, there, has, there have to be categories. There have to be names. Otherwise, you can't communicate. So the first thing that uh, science that likes to do is put things into categories. If you look at all these organisms on this slide, there's horses and octopus and trees and all sorts of stuff. And if you just look at it as a normal person or scientist, don't care who you are, you see categories probably. You don't have to look too hard. Um, so for instance, we put up, I would probably put teeny things that you see under a microscope in one category, and that's fair. We might all put things that don't have brains but are pretty big um, in one category. We might have put th we might put things that don't have a skeleton in one character in, in one category, um, but have brains. They have brains as well. These have brains and a skeleton, um, and then these have neither. But they can make food with nothing but sunlight and water and air. That's pretty cool. And this, well, this is the oddball. It doesn't have brain, it doesn't do photosynthesis, it's got all sorts of weird things, so it's all by itself. We can look at a group of organisms that are less obvious, like you can obviously tell that a, a tree and a walrus are in different groups. But when you look at all these parrots here, uh, and parakeets, they're, they're fairly similar. How do you categorize them? Well, scientists, uh, we, we look at these and we look for similarities. Um, some, and so in this particular case, they're able to separate these into three major groups. And what we look at as scientists to separate them is the New Zealand parrots are all fairly, um, 
they're, a lot of them are flightless and they nest on the ground largely. That's their sort of thing that separates them out. The cockatoos, pretty obvious. They have that lovely doodad on their head and they have um, short, shorter beaks. And then the true parrots over on the right there, obviously they have the long hooked beaks and they don't have any doodads on their heads. Um, so those can be categorized fairly easily. Insects, this is my bag right here, baby. And uh, they're not as easy to categorize. If you look at this and you're not an entomologist, how you categorize these might, might be kind of tricky. If you look in the upper left-hand corner at the ladybug and the critter that's directly to its right, uh, would you say those go together? They actually don't. Um, they are so very different in reality. And if you look at the two blue insects up on the right, they're actually pretty closely related, even though they look incredibly different in terms of all these organisms going together. So, boink, let me tell you what makes them all go together. Uh, everything that's with the orange border right now, all of those organisms have uh, immature stages, or, or they're babies, if you will. They're developing juvenile uh, part of their life uh, cycle. That, is, that are very different from the adult. You know this, caterpillars are super different from butterflies. They are the same organism. If you look at the ones in the lower right-hand corner, all of these insects, they all have the juveniles or the babies, if you will, look very similar to the adults. They're just smaller. That's kind of basically it. And the dragonfly up there, it's just completely wacky. If you look at that as an entomologist, it's got its wings held differently. It has a different mechanism by which the wings uh, work. And um, if you look at it in the fossil record, it is much more ancient than all the other ones. So that's how entomologists would separate these things out. And um, let's look at it. Don't freak out. This is just a little bitty tree here. Um, and I'll explain it to you to the level that you need to understand it at this point. This is, um, and, and by the way, all the photographs that I have, I've tried to give credit where it's uh, required, um, but mostly they should be public domain photographs. This is from uh, Mike Engel and David Grimald's, uh, Grimaldi's uh, work. The two triangles on the right that are green, those are the butterflies and the flies. You can tell by looking at it, the green critters, they're more closely related. And the purple triangle critters down there, the wasps and bees and stuff like that, they're less related to the green ones. And if you work on your way down, that's how that works. It has to do with how closely related they are, those, those uh, forks. Wow, okay, so there's a lot of information there. Bam, and this is the Tree of Life, and it was put together by David Hillis and um, two other scientists that he was working with, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the name. I forgot my notes. Uh, David Hillis is at UT. Um, right there, that's 3,000 species, 3,000 different organisms. That little gray haze around the edge of that circle, every gray little bitty thing there is a species. That's, and the, colors indicate the different groupings and the lines as, uh, indicate how they're organized and this roughly approximates the nine million species of organisms that live on earth and that little yellow arrow orangish arrow that just appeared there that's you that's all you are in that whole big picture um that's pretty intimate this is a lot of information packed on here and it can be kind of confusing so let me break it down let's look at this really primitive uh, gif that I made on Piskel. And it's, just watch it, watch those pink boxes go up. You've got time passing. When it's at the top, that's the most recent time. When it starts at the bottom there, those boxes are at the beginning of time. And each box represents a group of organisms. So that little box at the very bottom there, that is a living population. It's pink because it is a population of organisms that is alive. What is a population? I wanted to define that first because as obvious as it seems, it's not really terribly obvious if you think um, scientifically about it. 
if you took every wolf, um, all their genes, we know they have genes, everything has a gene, a set of genes that they pass from their, uh, from themselves to their uh, offspring. Wolves are the same way. If you take all the wolves and all their genes, that is a population. So that little pink square there, that is a living population. And that is the first population in this particular tree. When evolution occurs, time is going on. You see that now there's a black square at the bottom, which is an extinct population. That's that first population. Oop. And then it has kind of changed. That population has kind of changed one from another. It has split into two different populations. There are two pink boxes there. If it's too small to see, you're going to have to trust me on it. So time has passed here, and you have lots and lots of extinct populations, and you have the ones that are currently alive in pink. I hope that makes sense. Does that all make sense so far? Yeah, I think so. All righty. And I think your wolf population is a pretty interesting example because we mm -hmm. have several different types of wolf mm -hmm. in North America. Yep. And they're not necessarily reproductively compatible for lots of reasons. Right. Yes. This, I'm making this super clean. As mm -hmm. Jen has just pointed out, it's not this clean in real life. I'm not going to go into that detail. If you're a scientist out there pulling your hair out, go ahead and look at David Hillis's Tree of Life again and talk. That's got plenty of things that you can complain about there, too. Um, I'm just doing this for teaching purposes. All righty. So, oops, like Jen said, there's a, a collie right in the middle of the wolf there, unfortunately. But there's a wolf in the middle there. And if you uh, look at all these dogs around here, every single breed there came from the wolf. Every single breed. Look at the diversity there. It's an amazing amount of diversity. You have short hair, long hair, never sheds hair, naked hair, colors, sizes, shapes, and behaviors all sorts of things that have all been pulled out of the genes of the wolf population. So, if we go back to our little tree here that we're generating, that long line that, that's pretty much staying right above the very first population, right there, it's not changing much from the bottom to the top, that would be your wolf. It's not really changing a whole lot over time. Might change a little bit. You might get some speciation, like Jen is talking there, or at least some subspecies or some such, something that prevents them from mating with one another. But it's mostly the same. If you look at the difference between that critter and the one, the pink population over on the right there, let's say that is an Alaska, oh no, no, it's a Siberian husky. That's a Siberian husky. At, whoop jump too far, sorry. They were last from the same population of wolves a long time ago, where that arrow at the bottom is. And over time, the population of wolves that split off there was bred by humans to become more and more Siberian Husky. So if you look at that wolf and say the critter that's over here in this, the far left pink box, that would be something like, say, a bulldog. There's a lot of change that has happened there, even though it's the same amount of time. The genes have changed a lot. And just look at the bulldog. It's so different from a wolf, but that those things could breed together if, if you put them together. They're the same species. All right, so if we look at that bottom of that fork where they split oop, to the top, the difference between that split up at the bottom and the split that's on the yellow air at the top. I hope I didn't lose you there. Um, I'm not, I don't have my notes, but uh, the difference between these two critters, I think the slides got mixed up a little bit, I apologize. Uh, that is, oh, now I remember, I apologize. That's an Alaskan Malamute, and it was, uh, I'm going to go back to that previous slide. Forgive me for a moment. Dogs at the bottom there, 
uh, split off. They were bred from wolves in the old world, and they're about 12,000 years old. Or 12, they've been bred for about 12,000 years. And oops, it jumped, I'm sorry. Wow. Ah! Okay, so there is the North American wolves, a population that has been split and uh, gave, given rise to the New World dogs. Two different events, folks. And so this critter has not changed much from the wolf. It looks very similar to the Siberian Husky, right? Because it's got the same things that what it was bred for, but it's different, different subset of genes. And it's because it was bred from a different bunch of wolves. So to summarize quickly, if you look at the two yellow arrows, the, the difference between the wolf and the other pink square is greater than the two arrows that are white. And that has to do with how much time they had, they got to evolve. If you look at these two sets of arrows, they're the white arrows, the two populations are different, more different from the yellow. And it's because, not because they didn't have more time, but because they just had greater change in the population more quickly. Alrighty, so back to our wolf with the unfortunate lassie right in the middle of her face. Is everybody okay so far? Jen, have I done okay so far? No, you're doing great. <laughs> All righty. With you so far. Okay, I'm not wearing anybody out. Let's take a little breather. So that's what we've got so far. Now, new thing on this. Pink boxes all across the top. And then there's that one branch right there that doesn't have a pink box. What happened there? Extinction. Ex extinction, it died yep. out. Yep, it died out. This happens all the time. Lots of things go extinct. And so the entire tree, if you look at it at the very end, there are only four organisms at the top that have lived, that have um, prospered. So if we look at the whole thing again, hopefully it makes more sense now. All the way up. Over time, populations change. Time can cause populations to change. Pressure from the environment can cause them to change more rapidly, even if it's a shorter amount of time. All righty there. Now, those four at the top, let's take a look at them up close and personal. There are four of them. And if you look at it, they all four, the last time they had a population that they all had in common, in other words, the population that they all evolved from was way back there. So this organism and this organism both came, that was their most recent uh, common population. This organism and this organism, their most recent population that they had in common was more recent, or even more recent. So let's just pretend that this organism down at the bottom here is this little critter. And believe it or not, that is a real critter. It's a, called a finger monkey. And let's just say that over time, evolution occurred. And from that critter, we derived its split, and these two populations were derived from that. And then evolution occurred some more, and then even more. So I hope this makes it very clear that I agree with you, no matter who you are, your granddaddy was not an ape. You are no more an ape than you are a fungus. You are your own independent evolutionary pathway. It's just that our ancestor back there gave rise to these other organisms as well. We are as different from the apes as a cockroach is from a butterfly, as a bird is from a bat. I mean, it, it just depends on how many genes you have in common. So when you look at things in terms of, I don't want to look like that, you're looking at it in the wrong way, frankly. Right, that's, that's an emotional 
It response. is an emotional response. And I get it. Yeah, but sure. But if you want to look at it like science does, or um, and I don't mean to sound all ivory tower, that's not the point. This is what the physical characteristics of the organisms reflect. This is what behavior reflects. This is what the genes reflect when we start taking them apart. And I'll show you a really amazing exam example of that in a while in these slides. So it's not uh, just something that we make up to aggravate people who want to believe that God made me perfect and wonderful and I'm modeled after something perfect. Okay, so in fact, the uh, little critter at the, at the juncture back there on the far left, that little finger monkey. He's very cute, by the way. He's super cute, yeah. I wouldn't mind being related to that too much. Um, this is the actual animal that we believe generated all these populations at this point. Uh, whoop, my finger slipped, I'm sorry. Uh, so that kind of brings me to what we were just talking about. There's still this notion that uh, human beings have to be up on a pedestal. We are somehow better and unique. Um, we are unique. We are amazing. We have mastered fire. We have amazing brains. We wear clothes. I don't know, you know, that's... We have pretty. thumbs. We have thumbs. You know, but so do the great apes. And, sure. and so do pandas have evolved their own version of that. So let's just get past that for just a second, the whole pedestal thing. Are we really... Are these not cute? I mean, we're related to these as well, if you want to put it that way. And really, are, are we that perfect? I'm not saying that we're all unattractive and, and ungroomed and unkempt or whatever, but really? I don't, I don't see us as being that much different from uh, other animals in that way. Okay, get, look at this picture. Get over your visceral revulsion at the fact that this uh, chimpanzee is very old, he's blind in one eye, um, he's all sorts of things that a lot of people would find uh, aesthetically unappealing. Uh, just look at the arms, look at the side of his body, look at the thigh and the, the musculature there, and that really doesn't look that different from us to me. Yes, the skin color is different. Yes, they have hair. They probably look at us and think, ew, they're naked. That's really ugly. What's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, and when I look at this animal's eyes, she's got a lot going on back there. We, we walk. We walk on two legs. So what? So do birds. We, we dream and we sleep. Well, so do dogs. Uh, and did you know that insects sleep too? Maybe they dream, don't know. We play, so do they. We solve puzzles and so do they. We have aesthetic preferences, so do they. We farm, and so do they. We plan for the future, and so do they. We talk. So do they. We have emotions that show on our faces, and so do they. Um, it's pretty clear to all of us people looking at the young boy on the left that he's in a lot of pain, and that's from a pain study. Um, the upper right hand shows what's called pain face in horses, and if you look at the horse on A, that's a happy horse. B. The position in the ears, the eyebrows, the nostril, the way the mouth starts to clinch and the lips change gets worse and worse. And if you look at the horse in the bottom right hand picture, what's that horse feeling? Pain. We like to show off just like they do. We believe ridiculous things and so do they. We love, and there have been recent studies, MRI studies, that show that the dog's brain reacts the same way as our brain does when the dog considers us. Not so different. Horses are super stupid, right? They have theory of mind. They can read our emotions. 
And then there's this, which to me has um, a pretty weighty feel to it. When I look at the eyes of primates, I see a lot going on there. I don't think they're dull or stupid. I think if I were put in a very small enclosure and being as intelligent as most humans are, you become a different organism. I don't think judging them by what they are in the zoo is fair. Well, we kind of see that with incarcerated humans. They, yeah. They become different people. It's the worst torture yeah. there is. To be in prison, I just can't even begin to imagine how boring that is. And boredom is the worst torture there is. Um, well, I should not say that. People can certainly come up with something worse. But I'm saying it's bad, and it, it shows in the animals that we keep in zoos. Uh, all these things, consider, well, we love our, our um, and take care of our infants, and so do they. Um, I don't think we're all that incredibly different. Oops. And then, ah, so there is one more thing. Just recently, uh, they have discovered, well, I guess within, I think it was 2008, they discovered a new set of genes that are super closely related to humans, and it's the Denisovan set of genes. On the right-hand side, you see the genetic uh, makeup of, uh, on the top of gorillas, then chimps below that in the square, bonobos below that, and then Denisovans. Denisovans um, are just as closely related to us as, say, Neanderthals. And it's a pretty good chance that every single one of us has genes from one or the other in us. Denisovan genes are actually what helps Tibetans uh, survive so well in high climates. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it's not, it's there. Yeah. And if you look at um, human populations, it's there. Mm -hmm. especially in Australian uh, native populations. We are not so far removed, and yet we are. It's, it's all kind of complicated, as we would like to think. So that's what I want people to consider when they think about humans and evolution and the icky factor. Yeah. Is it really that icky? Maybe think about it a little bit. Thank you. All right. All right, very, very interesting. Thank you. All right, so um, ready to take some calls? Yes. Okay, so very excited about let that. me go to the call box here, and um, I think we're gonna take a call from Corey in New York. Okay. Hi, Corey, you're on the air. Hello. Hello. Hello, oh, hi, how are you doing, Claire? I'm good. How are you? I, I found, I, I'm good. I found your talk interesting, how you, you compared us to fungus, and you, and you talked about the emotions of animals, and we're, we're just like a fungus kind of working our way through life. That's not exactly That's, the yeah. comparison I made. I think you're, you're pulling it pretty far. We, we have genes in common uh, with nearly everything that's living that I know of. Uh, human beings, I, I, my, my goal here is to help uh, people see humans and other organisms as uh, less apart from one another, more like one another. Uh, fungus, yeah, we have some stuff in common with it. And yes, I get your point, which I think you're going to, is that humans are not all that great. Is no, that I don't think going? that. Okay. I mean, if you're comparing us to fungus, then do, you, do you believe that fungus has emotions? No, that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, I, mean, I thought so too. Okay, I did not compare. There, if, if you... Well, we, genes, we got similarities, right? Yes. Well, genes oh. uh, code for lots of different things, and mm -hmm. the genes that we have and other organisms have, uh, sometimes they coincide and sometimes they don't. Um, but we have more in, similar, in common than, lo than not because... Like we what? All, like sorry. what? Well, like what? we all... Uh, most of the organisms that... I think I'm, Everything that I mentioned, except maybe bacteria, br uh, rely on oxygen t for respiration, right? 
There's okay. a lot of chemistry and a lot of, of genes that go into making that work. And so we have all that in common. We, every single organism alive, uh, relies on DNA and RNA to reproduce and to code for proteins. Uh, the proteins that we are made of, that's all in the DNA. It's all just chemistry. Um, and it's all similar. So okay. does that help? Yeah, I, I kind of got off my question. I was going to ask right, about your, I, I had, I had saw, I had saw your, uh, your video on YouTube about redefining morality. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And you said like how, like in a pride of lions, like one male lion will walk into a pride of lions and kill the male. Then he'll kill the children and you'll mate with the female. I didn't say kill the male, but yes, he will kill the cubs of any. Uh, well, he's got to kill the male first, right? Then well, kill no, the he has to just defeat him. Yeah. Well, all right. Well, Sorry, I'm being too exact. You, you said you on your video. You did say kill. I mean, you can look it up if you think I'm lying. Okay, I'm not lying, I don't think but... you're lying. I probably misspoke. Go on. Okay. Well, you said it, so that makes it anyway. Yes, I misspoke. What's that? If that's what I said, then I misspoke. It's easy well, to do. I'm just holding you accountable for what you said, that's all. Okay, I'm accountable. Right. I misspoke. Go on. Okay. Do you, do you think if a, if a lion walks into a, a pride of lions and kills another lion and does that, do you think it's morally wrong for a lion to do that? No. There's Why no not? morals there. It's, it's, Why don't you think it's wrong? If that's you're, that's a reproductive strategy for lions. Yeah, if they well, wait, don't. But wait, I, Okay, but if a human being does that, if he walks into like a like a marriage and kills the husband and then kills the kids, you you don't think that's wrong? Of course I do. Well, if, why why codify the world animals, right? They have okay. So let's talk about morality. If this is what you want to talk about. Well, no. Why codify? That doesn't make any sense. I did not codify anything. I don't think. Well, sure you did. You're differentiating animal from animal. If we're all just animals, yes. then one animal kills another one, do, that doesn't do you make not, any sense, do you not, logically. Do you not understand why it's wrong for a human to go into another family and kill one of the parents? No, and, you tell me. You tell me why it's no, wrong. No, I'm, I'm asking you. Why do you, do you not understand that it's wrong to do that? Well, if it's not wrong for a lion, why is it wrong for me? Um, because we're different species. In what way? Um, did you not pay attention to Claire's I sure presentation? did, but if okay. if you're, you're saying we're all animals. Why are you codifying? Why are you differentiating humans from lions? Let me, I can answer that animals. if you'll just well, go ahead. a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, when it comes to being a social animal, there are behaviors that work and behaviors that don't. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Which, who's the social animal, us or the lions? Why yeah. are you differentiating? Okay, so if you want to go that route... Uh, so different cultures, like in, in Texas, um, we have the death penalty and there are states that don't. Yeah, we hold people accountable. We, lions don't do that to other lions. Sure they do. They don't arrest them. And, no, they don't. They don't take them yes. to jail. And, oh, just, they do? Let's back, back up just a second. You're coming in with um, preconceived notions that that are just as reactionary as as sure. the emotion. Yes. Okay. So, if I believe you, all right. Go ahead. All right. So, if you are a lion and you go into a group of lionesses. As the so you're new comparing lion. me to a lion. You're comparing. Corey, you're on hold because if you're going to keep interrupting, you're going to get dropped. So I'll take you off hold, but Claire's going to talk and answer your question, and you're going to be polite and not interrupt. I am not comparing you to a lion. I'm talking about social organisms. This is what science do. We talk about the different ways to be social. Let's take it away from lions for a second, shall we? Let's go to okay. bees. Just for a second. Bees, what do you know about bees? You know about honeybees? They're social? They sting. They sting. Uh, do you know, well, this is interesting. They sting only if they're female. And that's because the stinger is a modified part of the reproductive 
la egg laying mechanism. So why would a bunch of female bees give up their own chance to have their own hive to stay and defend a nest? Why? Because overall, if you look at the science, the advantage of that type of social behavior is that if they help that hive, the queen, their mother, can reproduce more progeny. And if you do the math, it makes sense. The same thing goes for lions and why they do what they do and human beings and why they do what they do. Every type of social animal has its own set of what works. You don't have to call it laws. You don't have to call it codify. I, I, it's I just what evolutionarily you. works. Yeah, but you're saying it's, it's wrong for a human being to kill a human being like that, but it's not morally wrong for a lion to do that. So, yes. So? Do you think it's morally wrong for the lion to kill, to reproduce? Do you understand no. why the lion kills the cubs? Do you know why? Uh, I'm guessing it's not for moral reasons. Right. Right. It's because... Or, those, immoral, or, or, or immoral reasons. Right. It has to do with passing on genes. The lion that was there before that fathered those cubs, he doesn't want to kill uh, food and defend these, this pride if they're not his babies. He wants his genes to pass on, not the lion before. So in order to make the females go into estrus more quickly so that he can mate with them and pass his genes on, he kills the cubs. It seems horribly immoral in our world, but they have a different world. Their motivations are different. Well, thank you, and I didn't mean to be rude, and I really apologize if I was. No worries, no but, problem. But I want to I ask you, what kind of genes do bluebirds have? What kind of genes do bluebirds have? How do you mean? Yeah. They have bluebirds. Blue genes. Gene. Blue genes, get it? <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. You, you both have a good night. You too. All right, thanks. You too. Thanks. Get easy. Bye. All right. Okay. Let me take a sip here. All right, sure. So let's see. We it looks like we have all atheists on the line next. So um, and still, people need to understand. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. I'm looking for one that talks about evolution here. Um, Call in with your evolution questions. Yeah. Let's, try to answer them. Let's talk to John real quick. Hi, John. You're on the air. Hey. Thanks for having me. Sure. Yeah. So you had a comment. Well, I just wanted to speak. Well, yes, I want to speak brief, briefly about the efficacy of zoos and kind of hear from the guests today, um, because my argument, especially for the efficacy of zoos, would be that one, when you look at the animals in captivity, such as the gorillas, they generally live about 35 to 40 years in the wild. But in zoos, they do live longer, even if they're bored. They are living quite longer, around 50 years. And also, there's a lot of conservation efforts. You know, Steve Irwin, everyone loves the guy. I mean, sure. amazing conservationalist. Mm hmm so it seemed earlier, maybe I misinterpreted, but there was kind of a, a slight against zoos. And I realized some zoos might have unethical practices, mm -hmm. but zoos in theory and a well-run zoo, zoo, I think, is a great thing. I agree. I have seen zoos great. that are amazing, and it doesn't matter how big they are. Um, there's a, a zoo in Louisiana uh, that I, guess, I think it's called the Louisiana Purchase Zoo in Monroe, Louisiana, and I call it the little zoo that could. That zoo is small, but by golly, they take good care of those animals. Um, if I had to be in a zoo, I wouldn't mind being there. Uh, on the other hand, I've seen zoos where the animals are clearly exhibiting uh, behaviors that are indicative of boredom, anxiety, stress. Uh, these, that's a problem. I understand the need for zoos. I really do. Uh, but I think we need to do a better job if we're going to have them. You know, I think, I think you're exactly right. And there are a lot of boards and agencies that overlook zoos. 
And I know of some zoos, especially, that try to keep natural habitats without Mm -hmm. a lot of concrete for people to walk on. But surprisingly, people who go to the zoo then complain that there's not paved pathways and everything that they would expect at a zoo. Meanwhile, the zoo is more natural, which is what the animals expect. So, yeah. Yeah. Natural isn't just, that's not the whole thing. It also, it has to be interesting. If you think about everything that you do in a day to keep entertained, I have. I don't know about you, but I have been in jobs, just a job, that was boring. Mm-hmm. Oh my lord, those poor animals! If they're sitting there being bored all day, just sitting in a cubicle all day, eight hours a day, I at least get to go home. Um, oh, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. No, and I, th- I think there is a big conversation to have. I mean, you can just look at how people treat their own animals. We've kind of got that spectrum with zoos and spectrums with home animals where some people just, you know, it's like 10, 20 degrees and I see dogs outside. And I'm like, who is keeping right. their dog outside in the frigid cold? Yeah. And so we do have still that kind of aspect in our society on the personal level. Mm-hmm. Yeah, empathy well, is one of my big things and animals need our empathy in a big way. They well, suffer, thanks. they have emotions, etc. Right. I couldn't agree more, and I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks for calling. Yes, I, I, any woman who can read a horse's emotions from their face, you know, you know <laughs> we know you're really big on empathy there. Right. All right. So. Very. All right, let's talk to David in Minneapolis. Ooh. Hi, David. My hometown. Hi. Hi. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So how cold is it so- up there? <gasps> Oh my goodness, we've got wind chills right now that are, you know, negative, in the negative teens at least right now, so. Yeah. Yeah, anyone that's going to be going out and, and having fun on the new year definitely needs to wear layers, so. Yeah, yeah. My, my wife but, and son uh, just came back from a trip to Wisconsin yesterday, and they said oh, the, yeah. the high temperature the whole time they were there was 10. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, yeah we've definitely been in a cold snap recently, mm-hmm. so. So, yeah, um, I guess for the reason uh, that I was giving you guys a call is uh, I'm an atheist, but um, I come across and I enjoy listening to the arguments of the theists because I I like to kind of be able to expand uh, my ability to rebut some of that stuff. And I've recently come across a really intriguing argument that kind of um, is about the, the basic foundations of our ability to reason and use logic um, if evolution is true. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the argument from reason, but uh, that's that's what this is. And mm-hmm. um, So yeah, it's, uh, I mean, to kind of lay it out simply, it's if evolution is true and, 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 and also that the Big Bang is, is, is also presumed uh, a, a true representation of how things happened. Um, and if naturalism is true and atheism is true and it's a materialistic universe that, that has no, no guidance, um, why, why under that uh, should we assume that uh, truth-seeking, reasonable, logical brains uh, would be the outcome of that process? Well, there's a whole bunch of claims in there, and some of them don't have That's anything to. Yeah, it, some of them don't have anything to do with the others. So, like, whether or not the Big Bang is an accurate understanding of the origins of the universe as we know it, uh, whether or not that's true, has nothing to do with the fact of evolution. So, yeah, evolution, abiogenesis, the beginning of all stuff. That those are separate things. I can yeah. maybe deal with abiogenesis at another time, but we're just talking about when life started. That forward, that's evolution. Yeah. So okay. I guess I guess the the critical claim here, um, as as it relates to today's topic, is uh, basically how could evolution produce a brain that's capable of using reason and evidence to draw accurate conclusions? Oh boy. Right. Or why why um, that brain would be selected for, um, like, is, is, is a truth-seeking brain or one that's reasonable and able to make logical choices uh, necessarily one that's more able to survive? 
Okay. Um, I've because... got a lot to say about this. All right. You ready? Okay. Take it away. I'm really excited to hear it. Okay. <laughs> um, we, okay. Like I said, my PhD, it focused largely on behavior. And that's behavior across all, organ all organisms. I studied insects because you don't have to fill out a whole lot of paperwork to study insects. Nobody cares if you pull off a wing or whatever. Uh, if you study even uh, a snake, you have to fill out tons of, of paperwork. When it comes to uh, making decisions and having those be um, something that informs the way you live, all animals do it all the time. Um, unless they're operating 100% on insect, instinct, which there are some animals, I suppose, that do that, uh, there are decisions that go into a lot of things. Um, if you look at bears, I mean, just look at how many animals they have to make decisions. My, my, my guppies in my tank, they have learned that when the light goes on, food's coming, they come up. So they have learned to make that association. That is learning. It, it's, all organisms have to do it to a, to a degree. They have to be able to respond to their environment or else it doesn't work or else the, the extinction is, is sure to happen. That okay. Help answer it. So, I mean, like yes and no, okay. right? I mean, the so the light in your fish tank. I mean, your your fish we could assume has has has, has uh, uh, like a belief about that. Okay, when the light is on, I'm going to get fed soon. Mm -hmm. um, and it could make a truth claim about the world that well, we know that when lights are on, that means food is about to come. Uh huh. Uh, but that's not actually universally true about about the world. That's, that's oh, about really? That, you've fallen into my trap. That experience. All right. <laughs> okay, good. So, I'm glad. Okay. All right. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sure. I, I just also want to throw in here because the, the, the way that the theist argument that I've heard goes uh -huh. is also talking about how we can know that um, that our, we have like a consistent morality as well. So like, why is it that our fizzing brains over here that thought mm -hmm. that what Hitler was doing was wrong, why, how, how can we be right about that and his idea about that be wrong? What about evolution and an unguided process mm -hmm. would give us any indication of, of what's actually right or wrong as well. Okay, right and wrong. And I, I'm going to set that over here for just a second. Okay, and I'm all going right, to address right. the uh, animal's ability to understand what's going on, if you will. So, if you okay. take this, have you ever heard of the Skinner box? Skinner box, um, BF uh, Skinner. No. One of the slides I had, there was a pigeon in a box, and then there was a person rubbing a good luck thing on on the other side. Uh, people believe yeah, uh, in rubbing things brings them luck, and that's just the kind of the lower grade version of superstition that, to a lot of uh, atheists, uh, in its full blown expression, is religion. Um, so you take a pigeon and you stick it in a box where there is nothing in there except the pigeon, and then food pellets that come down, and that food pellet comes down. Uh, so the, and the pigeon wants that, right? So the pigeon's sitting, sitting in the box, and it's hungry, and it start. It kind of looks to the left, and food comes down. It's like, oh, yum! Oh, when I looked to the left, the food came down. So the pigeon starts looking to the left, and it's not working. So it looks to the left some more, to the left, and it goes to the left, and then it kind of steps over here a little bit, and food comes down, and it goes, oh, so if I turn left and put my foot there then the food's going to come down. And it keeps adding things. The food is coming down randomly, but the pigeon doesn't know this. It's just assigning uh, importance to things that are not important. If you let the pigeon do this for an hour, by the time you take the pigeon out of there, it will be doing a seriously complex dance to get that pellet to come down. We're not that unique. I've heard, yeah. I've heard of similar things when it comes to people on elevators, or uh, that they've there's like a door close button that doesn't actually work, but 
they feel like if they push it, it's going to work faster. And yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And when they see the doors close, then they assume that that's because, oh, okay, mm -hmm. I pushed it eight times, that made it happen. Well, I mean, you, you can see this at almost any crosswalk in any city. Mm -hmm. You know, if yep. you if you want the crosswalk, the walk sign to come on, you only have to push the button once. But there are people that will go up there and push it repeatedly because, you know, <laughs> and then, of course, the light changes and everything and, and they connect it with, oh, I pushed it, you know, a bunch of times and then that made it come up quicker. Well, no, it's on a timer. You know, you push it, it knows, mm -hmm. OK, I've got to get the traffic stopped and, and then, you know, the walk sign will come on. But, yeah, people have all kinds of weird beliefs about things that have, it has nothing at all to do with how things actually work. So how do we, I guess, and I don't want to take up a ton of time here if you guys have any theists that are on the lines, but uh, I mean, how does, I mean, how does that answer that we know that evolution created brains that are capable of things like reason and logic? Well, I mean, we're here, so <laughs> yeah. Uh, if well, right, but we're happens. assuming that we're here and we're reasonable and right. we're logical. Right. 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 And if it was an unguided process, I mean, we could be here mm -hmm. and it, we could have ended up completely irrational and illogical and not be aware of that. Well, you're, you're able to ask that because you are here. <laughs> it, it's kind of a circular thing. Yeah. Mushrooms don't ask these things. They're successful. They're doing just fine. Thank you very much. Bacteria is super successful. They're not saying, you know, how do we get here? They just are. They're just here. And we are one. If if you remember that tree of life that I put up that David Hill has put together, that's just 3,000 representing 9 million species. There's an, a super large number of organisms that don't think that at all, and they're doing just fine. Does that answer your question? I mean, yeah, I guess it still seems like a compelling argument uh and I, I don't know exactly how to defend that that yes in fact we do have reason to believe that we are logical and that and that our logic i mean because we use a lot of times as atheists you're kind of exposing um like an illogical an illogical thing or like a delusional belief or whatever um and so you're relying heavily on this logic and then to have an argument that kind of undercuts your uh, your certainty that logic is even something I, you should I, have access. I'd say we're not terribly know, logical, actually. Sense? Yeah, I yeah. think science is is in its perfection, uh, in its perfect state, would be very logical. But yeah, yeah, I think. But I that's think... just an extension of this issue because anything that comes from an illogical system, like our brain, so now we come up with a thing called science, and we say this is able to kind of help identify some of our biases or some of our illogical notions but it too would have been the creation of an illogical system that's the best we got like how do we, why do we have why should we have any faith that that's i mean i don't know faith but there's no yeah I mean, why you know the answer to that any, right yeah there, there's no faith involved i mean there. it's so, because it's useful right it, it's, it's consistent because of its utility it has well, predictive value yeah and I, I think i think part of the 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 thing that trips people up on this is the notion of evolution as an unguided process right all that means is that there's not some super intelligence looking down and and pulling the strings saying oh i want this branch of apes to evolve into mm -hmm. hominids, you know, whatever. Right. And th that's um, the fact that it's unguided uh, doesn't mean there aren't uh, forces that shape evolution. Lots of forces. And, and evolution I mean, is entirely yeah. due to forces acting I, on it. I mean, basically, basically, we have this genetic diversity that's inherent in every living organism. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the, the menu that we can choose from. Yeah. And then there are right. um, well said. environmental forces, um, uh, you know, other forces that act. Uh, some of them are social uh, because we're social species. And once you have a social species, then there are social factors that come into play that will then guide evolution and basically push it in a certain direction or another. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not... Well, and I, I guess I heard of a study where they did, like, um, like a computer simulation to see how um, like having true beliefs about the world that these like simulated creatures were in uh, affects their ability to survive. And it had like a direct negative effect that the, uh, the like, like what the study found and I, I'd have to find the exact study, but what it found out was that 
um, actually having completely erroneous thoughts about the world that you're in uh, was more conducive to your ability to survive and, 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 and not actually, uh, not actually a detriment. And that's, so I, I don't know why we would assume that evolution, it, where, while there are these different, uh, uh, you know, forces like our ability to identify a zebra that as, as a zebra and a tiger as a tiger was definitely helpful in, in our, in our ability to continue to survive. But what, about things like, is it reasonable to assume X given Y? I mean, what what makes us confident that our ability to create a system like science or, or to be reasonable or logical was something that would have been helpful in our survival? Because dark ages and then 200 years coming as far as we have. I mean, there's that's just a huge body of evidence right there. Thousands of years, we made little to no progress. And then with science, 200 years, we have come so far. Now we have also screwed things up in a big and bad way, and we have a lot of fixing to do. But we wouldn't have noticed that problem if we weren't doing good science too. Yeah. So it's all, uh, yeah, does that help at all? Yeah, 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 and I, again, I don't want to take up a ton of you guys this time. I appreciate you taking the call. I've sure. I've listened to you guys a long time, and uh, you and um, and I've I've been looking at the at the older tapes of Matt and answering all those different things. And I definitely appreciate you guys as a resource. So I hope you guys uh, that, you know keep on going. And if I'm ever ever in the Texas area, I'll I'll just swing by for the dinner afterwards. Right on. All right. So, Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Have a good rest of your show. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Although we should clarify that being in the Texas area may not get you very much. <laughs> since uh, This is a big state. Yeah, it's a really large state. Yeah. <laughs> Travel with children and you will discover just how big it is. Are we in Texas yeah. still? Yes. Still? <laughs> yes. Um, I actually want to go ahead and take Carl's call here because right he's got a question about religion and evolution so hi Carl you're on the air hi Jen and Clara it's uh nice to talk to you hi Carl yeah great uh my, my comment was just that I think that as atheists uh we should concede the past evolutionary usefulness of religion and explain its popularity by that and why now it's becoming a disadvantage well I I don't I think I have to concede anything by acknowledging that religion probably had some evolutionary advantages, especially as we were moving from a hunter-gatherer population to a more agrarian lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's where you see most of the rise of, um, like, especially the monotheistic religions. But, um, we had religion with us as a species uh, for as long as we know, um, and There's... it's always had an advantage to us. And I'm not saying, w w what I'm saying is, you know, we should concede that there was a past evolutionary advantage, and now it's like a vestigial organ for us, that, that basically it has outlived its usefulness, and, you know, that its popularity is because of of, of the advantages it did provide. When you look at the world, we see uh, a highly religious world, and there's a reason for it, because it had advantages to us in the past. Right. I, I, I get that religion can be horribly damaging. Totally, we're all on board of that, big atheist. Um, I, I also understand its draw. I went to a Christmas Eve service with my mother-in-law, I have lots of religious friends. Uh, as I sat there in her church, which was different from the one I grew up in, I got that same sort of, I can't even describe it. People call in all the time, I can't describe it, it just feels good. I, I felt that sort of whatever that feeling is while I was sitting there. Um, it's, a, it's a really comforting, that's the, the lamest word, feeling 
yeah. to have that, and, and I get its traction. And, and I mean, I think a lot of that has to do with um, the social aspect of being in, you know, in a place with a group of people, mm -hmm. and you're all sort of there. The community. We're social animals. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it gets yeah, it gets down to being a social animal. Um, and, and, and so now, now we need to move on, and we need to have a commu have communities that are outside of religion. Mm -hmm. Hence the atheist community of Boston. People. Yeah, we do. Exactly. We have those. Exactly. Like, like those. Mm -hmm. You know, but 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 like a worldwide change needs to occur. To, to, for us to move forward as a species um, to where we're all just one, you know, humans. Mm -hmm. And we're not divided up into these, these little, uh, little pieces. The fact that we're social animals means that that's never going to happen. I hate to tell yeah. you. The, the irony there is tremendous. Uh, we, we just can't handle... We'll always have tribalism at uh, our yeah. local level, uh, you know... It's always uh, going to be state, there. Our states or our countries, mm -hmm. uh, we need to recognize that it is tribalism and, and try to realize that we're united as a species here on, on planet Earth. I strive and for that only as well. One. I hope that... Well, if, if you figure out how to do that, how be to sure. Make it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, obviously your show is part of it, right? I mean, uh, that's... Well... That's, that's the way to move in that direction. Um, but but I, I just felt like there, there wasn't enough talk on the show about that there's a reason why we see the world the way it is. It's a, a cultural evolution. Um, as people, uh, our, our biggest evolution is culturally at this point um, because we no longer are, we're no longer surviving just from our like base, our base abilities to survive. Now it's how successful can you be uh, due to your culture ad adaptations. Well, I would actually disagree with that. I think we're still very much evolving, um, you know, on a physical level. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a, an article I, I read recently that talked about how uh, the prevalence of cesarean births is actually changing um, humans, mm -hmm. basically, um, you know, in times before C-sections were available, um, if uh, a woman, um, you know, was producing children who were too big for her birth canal, she would only do that once, you know, and then she and the child would die um, because, uh, you know, C-sections were not available. Um, and so that ends that possibility. Uh, those genes don't get passed on. Now, those children survive and so, you know, so are craniums getting bigger? Um, Is that what the I, study was finding? I, I think they're, they're, yeah, they're saying that you know uh, babies' heads are getting bigger and babies in general are getting bigger. How about that? Oh so, my gosh! Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not saying that we're not. I'm not saying that we're not evolving, but mm -hmm. but I would say that the cultural aspect of our evolution is much more rapid and, uh, and influential and, and in you could our survival. Probably argue that it always has been. Yeah, as much as anything, as much as communication yeah. could allow yeah at this point and, and the other thing i i, I kind of want to touch on was that religion itself is is evolving you know and you can look at the lines of christianity and look at like the catholic church and all the different bifurcations that have come off of it and it, it is essentially an evolutionary process and and people find advantage in the different sects that have broken off from it and and they make those Parts flourish, and you know, uh, I, I feel like the Catholic Church, which I used to be, uh, or I was raised in, mm -hmm. is 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 dying a slow uh, death, uh, and, and it's because it's not really evolving. It's it, it, it's stuck in this, and you know, its process is very slow, and um, it's not advantageous. There's there's a lot of churches that are kind of more the conservative, old school. They're dying off, and you have a bunch of old people in the pews, and there's no youth because uh, they are not advantageous anymore. Yeah, and so, I mean, where are you getting this information? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm convinced it's true. Uh, I, I don't know. In Texas, uh, well, I, I just, see I, religion getting stronger in some ways. Yeah. But I think that has well, to do with well, the Well, sure, but, but I, I'm saying that uh, those are in different... 
Well, it's just my personal observation of, of some Catholic churches. So I, I don't okay. have particular studies or anything like that to, to back up my, my, my feelings on this. Um, uh, it's just that I, I you know, I, I've seen I've seen various churches where you have an elder population in it, and there's no youth there, yeah. right? Because the youth have decided that this isn't for them. So, so I feel like they are dying off, or they have to change in order yeah. to attract the youth. So we're going to have a, a youth-oriented service with uh, rock and roll music playing uh, to try to draw in the youth. You know. Um, so, so I, I just wanted to, you know, mention that, you know, there's an evolutionary process involved in religion as well. It, it seems kind of obvious, you know, we're not living, we're not, we're not participating in some, you know, dark ages Catholicism. So obviously there's something has changed. I hope you're yep. right. I don't know if I see it everywhere. Well, I mean, you know, the latest uh, Pew research indicates that millennials are the least religious generation, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, so, uh, and, and, you know, I guess as time goes on, people are getting less and less religion, you know, religious. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the United States, uh, that's, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's a subsample and we're very biased. I don't know, I, I go home on Christmas to my husband's family and they're all deeply religious and from infancy, uh, the children are taught and uh, right. excited to learn who the baby Jesus is. Can you find the baby Jesus in the crush? And it's so important to them. Yeah. It's it's just, uh, and it's not going away. Yeah. It's the next generation. And so that's fine. They're good people. They do good things. Um, I, my in-laws, I adore them. Uh, but I don't see religion going away anytime soon. And I think the research supports that, unfortunately, for uh, the bad religions. Well, I, I certainly don't, don't think it's going away anytime soon. Um, I, I just, I feel like it's no longer an advantage to us as, as a species. And it's an unfortunate, like I said, a vestigial organ, like a, an appendix, you know, mm. you're better off not having it, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, but it's there. And, um, that's the, the the situation we find ourselves in. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, we we've got just a few minutes left in the show, and I want to get to at least one more caller, so I'm going to let you go. So thanks, thanks much. Bye. All right. Nice thanks talking for to you. Call. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. I would have to um, have one comment on that. He was saying that you know, that religion was um, always beneficial, or some kind of somehow universally beneficial, mm -hmm. and I don't think you can actually make that claim uh, because we don't really know um, exactly what role mm -hmm. religion played in like primitive human cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some hints about that, but we don't know, mm -hmm. you know, if that was a big deal. But the other thing is it wouldn't have to be necessarily beneficial. All it had to be was not detrimental. Right and it would get passed along. And I would say that no matter what time you're talking about, there are gonna be detrimental aspects to it. Oh, sure. Women yeah. are shunned and so forth. I mean, one of the most obvious detrimental aspects would be prohibitions on eating certain things. <laughs> right. Because if you're a human- Food is food. <laughs> if, yeah, if you're a human tribe and you're moving into a new area, but you have this prohibition on, uh, you know, that says that you can't eat fish, and you move into a seaside community, and fish is the most available source of protein, but you're not going to eat it. Um, it's pretty disadvantageous. Yeah, you you might die. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think that actually happened to one of the early settlements in Greenland. Really? One of the early Viking settlements. They had wow. some prohibitions about eating certain kinds of protein. Mm -hmm. And it was there. It was very abundant and everything. And they didn't eat it, and they died. Okay. Well, there I you think go. that was a Jared Diamond thing. So. Oh, I don't remember that in that book. But okay. Uh -huh. Anyway, but yeah. yeah. So um, let's see. Let's see. Uh, I think it's Ahmed we're going to talk to here. Let's... Hi, Ahmed. Yes, hello. Hello, you're on hi. the air. Um, hi, Jen. Um, sorry, I don't know the other host's it's name. Claire. Uh, hi, Claire. Hi. Ahmed. hi. And, uh, 
I'm calling from Pakistan, and it's uh, been five hours since New Year, so... Oh, well, Happy New Year. New Year. <laughs> <laughs> calling from the future. All right. <laughs> um, you're one of my favorite hosts, actually. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I've been uh, watching your show for a very long time now. Um, it's the first time I'm calling. Um, I am born and raised Muslim. Um, and uh, was a staunch believer of it for a very, very long time. Um, and recently, in the past uh, <laughs> couple of months, I've um, come to realize that a lot of the teachings cannot be true. Um, so I'm stuck in between this uh, this weird position where um, there is so much um, um, magnificent and... Um, uh, impressive science that's uh, available inside the Quran. Um, but then there's also so many of the other things, uh, a lot of the things which you guys refute, which uh, I really have to agree with. Um, so I'm ca I really kind of stuck inside a position where uh, some of it I feel might be true and then some of it absolutely cannot be true. And um, you know, uh, it kind of makes me, sometimes I want to believe it, despite all the irregularities, and um, so I really don't know what to do. Um, also, the other thing is, um, I have come from a religious uh, household, so a lot of everybody in my house um, prays. Um, mm -hmm. Muslims are supposed to pray five times a day. I used to, and I don't anymore, and they've started noticing this, so I just cannot say to them that I don't believe this anymore. Right. Um, so do you kind of see where I'm coming from? Yes, yeah. Um, well, regarding the, the claims that the Quran contains some impressive science, okay, um, I'm not an expert on the Quran, um, but I've heard these claims made by people over and over again, and when you investigate, what you find out is that it's really not that impressive. Um, I've also heard people make the same claims about the Bible, that there are passages in the Bible that reveal um, certain wisdom, and you know there was no way for people at the time that this was written to have known that, um, and if you, what I would suggest is that if you have somebody making a claim that there's some great science in a particular passage, go in and read that passage as if you'd never heard anybody make any claims about science there. As if you're an outsider reading this text for the first time and no one is claiming it's about science. If, and, and if you read that passage and you don't get any kind of science out of it, then what you're seeing is that somebody's coming in after the fact and reinterpreting that in light of what science has discovered since then. And they're basically applying that interpretation to that passage. It kind of sounds to me like right. you're hungry for maybe some more answers. And if you want a book that is full of amazing science, read Charles Darwin's On the Origin of Species. Yeah. It's an amazing read. The man put together words like nobody else and put them to, put these ideas together out of uh, brilliance. It's just brilliant. Uh, but I, the I, family, I uh, yeah, that's hard. Um, uh, sorry, I definitely do agree with um, what you just said. Um, if you do reread those passages uh, sometimes, uh, it comes out as if it was a particular kind of interpretation. Um, for example, uh, it is taught that, uh, it is said in the Quran that the moon revolves around uh, the earth, which is fine, but it also said that the moon has reflected light. It doesn't have light of its own. And when I investigated that, that it turned out that the, the word that's used, there's three meanings of that word, and one of the very, very less used meaning was ref, was that of a reflective lamp, so mm -hmm. to speak. So that's kind of shady, but I would say like there's other things like that the earth 
orbits the sun. Um, now, I know that at the time this may have not been known to people of that area, but I think it's possible it might have been known to people of other areas of the world, but then how would it have been communicated? Um, you know, so it's like some things are just, I feel like it, it, it's interpreted differently now because we know of the science and then some right. things are just, um, some things just still impress me. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I think that you're on the right track. You know, you're questioning your beliefs and, and you're investigating these things. And I mean, I, I would encourage you to continue to do that. And, and I would second Claire's recommendation to read Charles Darwin's book. Um, it's pretty phenomenal. And um, also um, Carl Sagan's book, Demon Haunted World. Um, that's... Uh, you know, a classic I have for read everybody. Richard Dawkins' book. Yeah. Um, the God Delusion. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, it's an eye opener. I do agree with most of what he says. Um, um, I have a, there, a I mean, there there are also other things like there's there's a lot of embryology in detail in the Quran. I'm not an embryologist, but it appears to be correct. Yeah. I don't so know how so l could. let me ask you something regarding that embryology stuff. Okay. You're talking about people who probably kept animals as livestock, right? Mm -hmm. Who wrote those passages? Do you think it's possible that they, um, you know, discovered some of this stuff in the course of butchering a pregnant animal? A lot of it is simply or, observation. Yeah. Uh, I, you wouldn't need any kind of divine knowledge. If the if the Quran said something about uh, ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny, now, now that would be pretty amazing. Uh, but the words and the things that it mentions that I know of, I am not by any means an expert, sounds like the sorts of things that somebody would observe a long time ago. Yeah. And it's not really science so much as it's observation, maybe a lucky guess here or there. And like you said, some wrong guesses here and there. Mm. Well, uh, some of it is, uh, it starts off by saying that uh, a human is created from a clot. And then uh, it's, it mentions the certain stages of the development of the embryo and then yeah. Abortion. the bones develop. and Women miscarry. <laughs> yeah, it's not that it's not that bizarre. Okay, it's not like they had uh, MRIs or other machinery that they could observe these things or um, son uh, sonograms and such. Women have mis been miscarrying right. since you know as long as women have been getting pregnant. Yep. All right. Well, well, I I certainly understand that. Um, I I do question everything I read, and a lot of it has turned out to be reinterpretation, mm -hmm. but yeah. um, uh, I'm sorry, was Claire the name of the other Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, um, Claire, you were saying something about the family? Uh, yeah, it's one thing to question religion and um, make those decisions and changes in your own mind, but when you're steeped in a world and a family that that religion is part and parcel of everything, uh, when I go home to my in-laws, th they view everything through the lens of God and Jesus. Um, it's very hard for them to identify with anything that is in my uh, worldview. Uh, they know I'm an atheist and my mother-in-law and I talk about it. Uh, so if you're the only one, and uh, I imagine it's somewhat similar to my husband becoming an atheist in his family. It's it's no small trick. There a lot of things can happen. And Greta Christina has a book, um, Coming Out Atheist, is that the name yep. of it? Yep. People telling their stories. Now I imagine it's mostly biased towards Christian stories. Uh, I know from a friend who teaches at an international school and has a lot of students from Saudi Arabia and other Muslim countries that it is not a small matter 
to reject right. Islam. It is no small matter. It's not like rejecting, rejecting Christianity here. Um, oh, yes. If I said this publicly, I'd be executed. Exactly. Yes. It's no small yes. matter. Uh, so for me to give you any sort of advice, mm -mm. you have yeah. to do what you I, need yeah, to do. Yeah, and, and in fact, even, you know, um, Christians who call us who don't have any connection to their family other than, you know, a social connection now, they're not dependent on them for anything, um, we always advise them that, you know, don't, um, don't feel like you have to come out to your family, if, especially if that would put you at some kind of risk. And, and that goes especially for someone in your situation. Uh, don't put yourself at risk. Um, you know, at some point, there may come a time when you can get to some place that's a little safer to be open as an atheist, but um, it sounds like that's not um, where you are right now, and so I don't want you to do anything that would put you at risk. I think lying is a fine thing. Yeah. Yeah, in those instances. Yes. Right. And then I have a, a third sort of concern. I don't know if it's a concern or not. But there are times when I really want to go back and just into believing. And I know right. I'm like shutting down my common sense at that point. And I do understand it's for comfort. Um, but, you know, there are times when you absolutely have no hope and then sort of that comes naturally to you. Right. What do you do in those times? I don't have those times anymore. I, I don't actually ever want to go back. Um, and, and I actually, I guess my deconversion happened over a period of time. It wasn't like I woke up one day and had this epiphany and, and decided, oh, I'm an atheist today. It was sort of a, a longer period of time. Um, and by the time I got to the point where I realized I was an atheist, I really didn't, um, I, I hadn't been part of any kind of religious community for a long time anyway. And so uh, I just never wanted to go back there. Um, it doesn't mean that I didn't want community. And I think part of that is, um, is a desire for that community. And so um, this is where kind of being unable to come out as an atheist is kind of a problem. Um, my recommendation right now would be is if you can join online atheist communities, that may be the best option for you in this situation. And especially if you can join a community where you can talk openly about, you know, kind of where you are in terms of this feeling like you need, you know, or you want to go back, you want to believe again. Even that can be dangerous, though. Yeah, it, yeah, even it, it can. And so, can you write I mean, letters to somebody here in the United States, uh, maybe that would be all right. Or, you know, if you can, if you can be on in those communities, either as like in Facebook communities, some of them are closed. So that doesn't, you know, if it's a, um, or a secret group, it doesn't show up on your timeline. Um, so that's a possibility. Um, using a pseudonym, um, that's another option there so that um, your friends and family don't know it's you. Um, but there, there are ways of creating community now that didn't exist in the past. Um, and my response to his original question would be different from Jen's. I, too, uh, was raised Catholic. And, slow, and always had trouble with religion, but didn't let go of it until later on. Um, and I don't need any of the trappings of religiosity. The one thing that I fervently wish was true is that there's an afterlife, some sort of afterlife. Um, I think David Bowie said something like, the one thing that doubles him over about dying was not getting to see his daughter grow. I, I want to see what happens. That's, I want an afterlife. It's not happening. Yeah. And that's just something that I accept, not happily, but I do. Yeah. Somehow I don't really care too much about afterlife. Everybody's different. Just, yeah. Uh, it's just the knowledge that I, I want to have about what actually happens. Where does consciousness go if it even goes anywhere? It doesn't, it stops. This, it's, like yeah. a, it's like a car, if, you know, cars go and go and go and you can take out parts and you, it can, it'll still run and eventually it stops. No spirit, no nothing left it, it just doesn't work anymore. And yeah. we're, just, we're just a bag of chemicals, hate to get real 
down to the bottom of it, we're, bad, we're a bunch of chemistry going right. And a lot of that chemistry can go wrong, and you keep on living. You can lose a rear view mirror, you can all this sort of thing, <laughs> but you'll keep chugging along, and eventually that last piston will go, and that's it. And you just stop running. There's no spirit, there's nothing happening there, really, other than chemistry, all gone right. And that is a hard thing to wrap your head around. I know. Yep. And on that note, we are actually right. over time here, okay. so I'm going to let you go. Um, thanks for your call. Thank you for calling, and good right. luck. And yeah, thank good luck. Happy thank New you. Year. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, Happy New Year, and thank you so much, and I will email you. All right. And um, uh, thanks for all the support. Thanks. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Take care. All right. Well, we, as I said, we are uh, actually about five minutes over time here. Okay. It was fun. Super fun. Thank you this so awesome. much for coming in and doing this. Oh, and my pleasure. We'll would love to have you back on the show to, love continue to continue back. the series. Yes. So what's next? Um, I think uh, are we going to do audience questions or are we going to wrap this up here? I guess it's up to the control room. No audience questions tonight. Okay. No. Then they I look guess, pretty rowdy out there. I don't know. Yeah. It's scary. All right. That it? I think we're done, but we're not clear yet. There we go. Hi, this is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. You know, The Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.